morning and welcome to Documentary New Zealand. In Fiordland, a float plane and a squirrel helicopter crashed just two weeks apart. Ten people were killed. The Transport Accident Investigation Commission sent three men to find out why. The commission is government funded and the accident investigators are independent of the aviation authorities. They have no power to prosecute or punish. They set out to find causes for two terrible accidents and that means starting at the point of impact. In the rugged South Island mountains, a small airplane with five people on board has simply disappeared. Police immediately start combing peaks and valleys for the float plane, which left Lake Tiana on a fine autumn afternoon. There's been no signal from its emergency locator beacon. By dawn the next day, rescue teams have fired up a full-scale search for the missing pilot and his passengers. In the last decade, 35 people have died in six major air accidents in this region. The missing pilot is Marty Davis. His Cessna float plane took off from Lake Tiana with Harry and Bev Turner from Timaru. Also on board were their daughter Sharon and her husband Grant, who were celebrating their wedding anniversary. In Wellington, a new case file is opened. Air accident investigator Ken Matthews starts an inquiry that will be far from routine. To find out why the float plane flight has gone so badly wrong. No sightings yet. Okay. Which area are you concentrating in just out of interest? The flight plan was to Milford Sound and back to Tianau. The search coordinator hopes the float plane has landed in one of the sounds. Yeah, so I guess you can't rule out the fact that, uh, you know, he might have gone into some water there as well. Oh, exactly. The EPIRB doesn't activate very well underwater. The missing pilot's last radio call is now 24 hours old. Before leaving for Tiana, Ken takes his case notes and to brief the chief investigator. Well, not an awful lot the Transport Accident Investigation Commission has two major aims. To find out why this plane is missing and to stop it happening again. We can't get away from the fact that an accident has happened. Um, it's happened for a reason or a variety of reasons. And um, uh, so basically somebody's done something wrong. You know, and, and we, we don't just focus on, on what happened, it's, it's why it happened. And it's not pointing the finger at anybody, it's merely pointing out what caused this accident. And, and so, OK, what can we do now to stop it happening again in the future with other operators and the same operator? Pulling this kit together, Ken knows it's been snowing in the mountains where the plane is lost. And that won't make the hunt for clues any easier. People tend to think of you as a bit of a super sleuth, but you know, a lot of people think, well, you must be, uh, have to be really bright, have to be really intelligent to be an air accident investigator. And I, I guess when you sit down hours, there are, there are some exciting aspects to our job. I and mean, I get to see some very exciting and interesting places. And sometimes I stand there and look at it and say, you know, what am I really doing here? You know, I mean, you, you know, there is that downside to it too, where you, where you tend to focus on the human tragedy side of it and, and see that. In Fiordland, searchers are having no success combing the rugged mountains around the missing pilot's last radio call. Searchers know the float plane is mostly white, tough to spot if it's crashed into the snow. Four planes lost in Fiordland have never been found, which worries John Van Tulzeman. With the snow on the tops and the rocks sticking out, you've got to look really hard. But what you've got to look for is colour. We know there's colour on the airplanes. Yeah, yeah. While rescue teams are grounded, the air accident investigators arrive in Tiana on the afternoon of day two. In the maintenance hangar where the float plane was serviced, they start collecting their evidence. Ken Matthews is in charge of the inquiry. The second okay. investigator well, is Ian McClellan, who's on his first job for the commission. He's on his way. Their priority is an interview well, with yeah, Jeff Ludeman, the engineer who maintained the missing plane. Ken and Ian want the maintenance logbooks. The workshop records show whether the Cessna was safe to fly. Yeah, well, I've maintained that aircraft for the last 15 years, probably. This is the third time Jeff Ludeman's been interviewed by investigators about the loss of a plane and pilot that he knew very well. Although his work has been cleared in the past, Jeff has a horrible fear that a friend and four passengers are missing because he's left something undone. For every accident, I, that's the first thing I think. It's a, something I've done. So especially in this latest one now, it's, uh, where nothing's been found for such a long period, I've got to relive everything I've done on that aircraft. The first night, Sunday night, I probably went through every nut and bolt and 
everything that we've changed on the aircraft. It's just it's one of those things that you just can't accept. And it's always in the back of your mind going over and over and over. And interviewing people close to the missing pilot yeah, makes an impression on the investigators as well. It's a humbling experience because people are suffering a lot themselves and you've got to be very careful of while trying to achieve your own objectives and investigating the cause that you don't step upon people's feelings. People don't deliberately fly an aircraft into the mountain or deliberately uh, contribute to an accident. And so uh, we've got to try and come out with some positive lessons and, be, and try and have a positive approach, really, as we, as we investigate. Ken and Ian must collect their evidence as quickly as possible. After dark, they interview pilot Alan Remnant about the flight path of the missing plane. And hunting for clues, Ken uplifts the company logbooks. It's important to secure the evidence as soon as we can. It's just so that, um, you know, we get the records as they are at that time so that um, nothing untoward can happen to them. I mean, I'm not suggesting in this case that anything would have. And if the engine was playing up, he certainly wouldn't have made 6,000 at the delivery. I haven't really formed any early, early views at all as to what may have gone, gone wrong. Um, we're talking... Uh, about an aircraft type that uh, generally is very reliable. Um, we're talking about a pilot who's very experienced, and uh, we've got weather that was relatively good on the day. Do you know what it was sort of like on the route that he was flying? Uh, uh, it was clear on the, on the actual route. There was just a little bit of cap cloud running north-south on the ridges pop up. The hardest thing is um, there's nothing positive to go and look at. The searchers are still out there searching for the wreckage and uh, they're all hopeful that there's still some survivors and I think we've got to be very, very sensitive to that and sort of take a, a backwards seat. We've still got to do our job, but be very sensitive to that. On the tops it's snow, snow tussock into the bush. Um, could be anywhere from the um, lake level to, to the tops of the mountains um, and it's just canyon after canyon. Just mind-boggling. The plane's now been missing for 52 hours. The search will start again at first light. A young oh, into its third day. And fading hopes are especially hard on helicopter pilot Bill Black. Just two weeks ago, Black was out searching for another missing aircraft. The helicopter that belonged to his good friend, Trevor Green, crashed just 70 kilometres south of Bill's helipad. All five on board were killed. Now Black is searching for five more. It's just gut wrenching in a row, isn't it? I mean, this is the second in a couple of weeks, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You might have got to keep trying. Thanks. A few metres away, Trevor Green's wreck squirrel is being stored in Bill's hangar while the inquiry into the accident is completed. Trevor Green had crashed two weeks earlier and Black found his mate's wrecked helicopter just before nightfall. Green was 47, a respected pilot, flying in ideal weather before the accident. He was carrying Peter Atkinson and his teenage son Adam, who was on his first big hunting trip. William Pickering was married with three children. His friend Michael Bell was also on board. Investigator John Goddard was called in from the Transport Accident Investigation Commission in Christchurch. John meets the recovery team at their field base, a few miles from the crash site, and he finds the media waiting. Well, it's big, big bush. I should think some of the trees are 100 plus feet high. Certainly a hostile place to put a helicopter. John Goddard's trail of clues starts on the wreck site itself. He's reported on over 100 air accidents, but with five dead, this crash is among the worst John has seen. The hunters were flying to a remote inlet when the chopper's emergency location transmitter went off. It took rescuers two hours to spot the few broken branches that pointed to the crash. John winches into the scene of the accident as soon as possible to record his first impressions before any evidence is moved. There could very well be things going wrong with the helicopter which we don't know about at this stage, but uh, it was substantially in one piece. As much of it as was meant to be was all there. And back at the field base, Ian Buick and Peter Wright mourn the loss of a good mate. It's a bastard, all right, it is. It is, yeah, I'm buddy. 
while the pilot's mates grieve, the bodies are being lifted out of the wrecked helicopter, and John is called in to help the recovery operation. They had recovered some of the victims from the wreckage. We assisted uh, with another one which was, was, uh, which was more difficult. They needed some extra manpower, basically. In an accident where there are some survivors and some fatalities, it can often be uh, really quite valuable to try to study what, um, <coughs> what might have caused the difference between uh, you know, why someone was seriously fatally injured and another person not. Later, in a cramped hotel room, John plans to go back to the crash site in the morning. Fuel spills and stains can be washed away. The wind will eventually bury the evidence he is looking for. So John's priority is to photograph the helicopter's position before he starts digging for clues. It seems to have crashed nose first, at normal flying speed. John's also asked an expert engineer to help his forensic investigation. Pete James knows this squirrel like no one else. He's maintained it for nearly 10 years. Pete and John start by making good on a personal promise. Looking for Trevor's watch. Family, the son's yes, request of the head set and his watch could be returned to him. Oh. That's probably Trevor's. First significant find is the helicopter's logbook. From this, John can tell how many hours the pilot had flown and whether he was spending too much time on duty. The speedometer and fuel and oil gauges are probably jammed in the position they were seconds before the impact. As they rip out the instrument panel, Pete James watches years of his own work destroyed. Sometimes you stop and take a second take and you're done. You can see what you've done in the past. It's hard to see it all broken. Last week I'll be carefully taping this up. The instrument panel is set aside. It's evidence John will examine later. The gauges and warning lights may shed light on some kind of mechanical failure. He also finds two of the passengers' cameras. Their photos may mean more leads to follow. Quite often, uh, passengers' shots of the flight can be um, really quite valuable in just showing, even if they don't show the flight path, close to the accident they can show the weather conditions the way people were sitting in the aircraft and all sorts of supplementary things around the overall scenes and there are clues to be found where the rotor blades have broken off john can't see any evidence of an emergency landing the main rotors were turning at full speed it's been a normal flight regime uh, as far as the main rotors concerned anyway that's just an early uh, thought of it then John notes the angle between the point of impact and the first broken treetops. The compass heading shows the chopper was flying west into the bush when it crashed. Track of approximately 300. But the biggest find of the day is Trevor Green's GPS. It's a small navigation computer, and the memory will tell him two very important things. What course was the pilot on, and how fast was he going? After John has collected what he can from around the wreck, the broken helicopter is taken away. Well. Pete James makes a final hunt for Trevor Green's watch. Just so I can honestly say that we looked as hard as we could for his dad's watch. But he especially asked for The engine and the pilot's controls can only be properly checked in a workshop. At this stage, mechanical failure is still a strong possibility. But on the edge of the forest, just minutes from his home base, Trevor Green's family is waiting with Ian Buick for their first sight of his helicopter. The wreck is trucked away to the company hangar in Tianau, where John will work into the night, looking for pieces to solve the puzzle. By daybreak, John will know if the pilot's controls were working properly and if the engine was running at full speed. I'm going to be looking at the control system connections, which are really under the floor, so I can um, <coughs> see if we should have had a controllable aircraft. At this stage, I'm not really uh, not working towards any theory. It's important not to do that. Uh, it's important to just take the evidence from the aircraft uh, <coughs> as it is and take it at face value and uh, not let any theories bias uh, what we're doing. 
But working late doesn't help the investigator solve the mystery. There are telltale gears in the transmission that will show Pete if the engine was under full power at the point of impact. But the gears are undamaged, which means they can't be sure. Pete and John carefully examine the oil and fuel system filters, and they collect fuel samples to take away for chemical analysis. Clean as a whistle here. There's nothing on the filter note here. Yeah, 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 yeah. The next day, John starts building a character profile of the pilot. Trevor Green had made a routine call two minutes before the crash, but he didn't call a mayday. And that puzzles Pete James, who's heard Green make an emergency landing before. He had an engine shut down two years ago when he ingested snow after picking up heliskis, and I was just flying out on the 327. And I heard him say, my motor's stopped. Like, that's the guy was. And I, I waited a few seconds. I said, Trevor, you're there? And he goes, hang on, I'm busy. And at that stage, he's pulled away from the slope and the engine stopped about here and he had to fl fly it back on. He's heading away. And still dealing with his own grief, Ian Buick talks to John about his work as company manager. I go over and over and over this in my head. And, um, and uh, you know, if... If that aircraft had been found at 5,000 feet on a ridge in, in questionable weather, I'd have just said, Trev, you just pushed the limits a bit far, my son, but mm. it wasn't. Acknowledging that the aircraft was in very good order, mm. um, I can't help but think something happened to Trevor. And when John meets the pathologist at Southland Hospital, he learns that Trevor Green's post-mortem result may be quite significant. The uh, pathologist is a, a little bit concerned about uh, his heart. He's doing some extra uh, tests and some, doing some extra work to uh, try to establish if there was a problem there. So, after three days on the ground, John has a mystery. An experienced pilot, flying in clear weather, crashed what seems to be a fully functioning helicopter. Unfortunately, photos taken by the four dead hunters won't tell John anything he doesn't already know. But the forensic evidence about Trevor Green's heart may be the break that will solve the case. Four of the float planes search. Six helicopters and three spotter planes have clocked up 100 hours in the air with no result. Searchers fear the float plane will never be found until Ian finally gets the news they've all been dreading. Uh, the police have just reported in now that the aircraft has been found. It's uh, located on a glacier, um, well up, and there are no survivors. It's sad because we had, you know, obviously you had some hope that there would have been survivors. And uh, so it's sad from that perspective. Um, but we must go on and, uh, and try and uh, at least try and get some sort of positive outcome. Photos show that the plane has slammed into a rock wall near the top of a ridge, and the wreckage has fallen 3,000 feet into the valley. If searchers had looked away for a split second, they'd have missed this flash of red metal, the only piece of foreign colour seen during the search. This is the red cow, nose cow, but I can't imagine it looking that large after an impact like that. Yeah. You know, I don't feel so bad in having seen that, not having worked that gully all that time and not seeing it. Examining the wreck site will be dangerous. Not only is the glacier steep and icy, the enormous fall from the mountain face into the valley below has completely destroyed the plain and wiped out some important clues. It makes our job uh, you know, that much more difficult. You know, we have to, uh, yeah, we have to be careful of safety issues in terms of being a equipped and kitted out for, you know, alpine conditions. And, uh, it may be more feasible just to recover a lot of the wreckage out before we do a detailed examination, but we, we certainly need to do some sort of a site or see an examination anyway. But what we've got to remember is that the accident occurred three days ago, and then there was a lot more snow. And so what we see now in these photos uh, is perhaps not a true representation of, of, the, of the scene the pilot saw at the time. And we've got to put ourselves in the pilot's perspective and say, more snow um, was white out or an optical illusion of possibility. To see things through the pilot's eyes, Ken and Ian need to make the trip to the remote crash site themselves. On the scene, police teams have begun the traumatic work of recovering five bodies from the mountain face. 
Nearly a kilometre above the remains of the float plane is the small pass the pilot aimed to fly through. But before the wreckage can be sifted for clues, the rain settles in again, and the forecast is for worse overnight. Ken and Ian have to wait one more day. Police clear everybody back to base until the next morning. And I think for recovery of those items at higher levels, it's got to be done with a combination of scoop net, long strop, safety harness and somebody hooked on the machine. It's a difficult situation, but there's people here with the right capabilities and experience to handle the job. And I think safety is, well, there's no doubt about it, safety is paramount. While working with the recovery operation, there are clear leads Ken has to follow up. I think the important thing for us is to have a look a little bit up higher, because that's where, because that's where the action started. Um, yeah, with, yeah, you understand that. Yeah. On the fifth day after the crash, Ken finally sees the wreckage that will direct his lines of inquiry from now on. The miscalculation from the pilot, for example, um, that you know, that is a possibility. Um, crossing the ridge line, um, we know there was a. Uh, a wind blowing there that um, may have created some downdrafts, um, so that is also a possibility. Um, but it's too early yet to say that they did contribute to the accident. Um, we have to substantiate them. As it fell a thousand metres into the valley, parts of the plane were caught by ledges high on the cliff face. Some of the pieces, like the propeller, are too dangerous to recover. Ken and Ian need to be sure that all the plane parts are in the one area to know the crash wasn't caused by something breaking off earlier in the flight. We look at the uh, start point for the wreckage and the direction it's spread in, so we've got to find out where the aircraft hit first and what part of the aircraft hit uh, first. We've also got to try and account for all parts of the aircraft. You know, did the aircraft lose some part before impact uh, or is it all there? Okay. What we'll do is we'll just get a photo of this in orientation to the, uh, the main wreckage. Okay. Um, first bit we found was the engine, and we had a, a, a superficial examination of that and then we covered it out of there so we can have a more detailed look. All right, here's the serial number. Okay. 282 962 Papa. You got that? Got it. Where the other main parts of the wreckage are, it's uh, fairly inaccessible. So we limited that to a, um, an aerial um, site inspection, just with a hovering helicopter and took extensive photographs and documented where everything was. Richard Hayes, the helicopter pilot, was up there and he identified the impact point at about 100 feet below the crest of the hill. And that's where the propeller is, and then everything's just fallen downhill from there. Mount Christina stands right behind the small pass. On a cloudy day, the pilot may have got them mixed up. And I would say that the aircraft has gone pretty well straight in. It's uh, almost at right angles. And the location of the impact would uh, also perhaps rule out a uh, engine failure situation if the pilot had an engine failure or malfunction of some sort. He'd have been hitting down the valley, not, uh, not at the side of the wall. From his experience of other mountain accidents, Ken spots telltale damage on the front of the wing. I was just saying it's very similar to the airship accident last year which flew straight into the side of the, of the mountain and both leading edges were very similar to this and uh, if you look at the other wing over there, very, very similar way, it just crushed right back and that gives you a picture of the probable attitude that he was in when he impacted. You know, in other words, he was he'd driven virtually straight on to the mountain. And in the tail section, Ian finds the sad reason the accident took so long to find. That's the emergency locator beacon, or part of it. One reason why it didn't uh, transmit. Oh, the whole thing's been uh, just shattered. The thing that we've established is that four of the aeroplane is there, the wings, the main wings are there, the empionage is there, the control surfaces are all there. Um, there's no evidence of fire. So yes, the wreckage has told us quite a bit here. Yeah. One of the search and rescue leaders knows how difficult it can be for investigators to find an answer. John Van Tunzelman's best friend died in a crash 40 years ago, and he's read every air accident report since then. They've got to deal with uh, all sorts of things, I mean, and obviously they've got to come up with the truthful conclusion 
that not everybody's going to be happy with. I mean, the, the uh, operators of the aircraft, the companies owning them, um, might have other views. Uh, the, uh, the families, of course, you know, if they say, well, we're looking at pilot error and the families don't really want to th believe that, that must be hard to deal with. So there's, yeah, no, it's a pretty tough call, actually. The wreck of the float plane is bundled up and taken back to Tiana for storage. As the investigators and recovery team prepare to leave the mountains, they bump into two hunters who heard the crash, but they didn't realise what it was. There was no ensuing sort of or subsequent roll on of sound. It was a, a boom that cut off and then there was a ting came back and it just, just sounded to me something like it was hitting a, a rock high up. A day later, the hunters were devastated to hear that the float plane had gone missing in the area they were camped. I was utterly convinced then. I, I just, there was never any doubt. I knew that what I'd heard was that aeroplane crash. I mean, I felt the same as Mike did. I felt physically sick straight away when it dawned us what we actually had heard, yeah. The next stage of the inquiry takes Ken and Ian to Queenstown Airport to meet the float plane's owner. The float plane company was investigated after another one of its planes crashed a year earlier. But owner Chris Willett wasn't impressed by the previous report. You know, we all want to know what happened and you'll see some brilliant accident reporting. You know, it's, it's like, you know, into forensic medicine almost, you know, they're guys that really know what they're doing. But once again, they're only human beings, and there are some duds. There are some guys that aren't very good. And, um, I'll tell you about these guys after I see the report. But I wish them well and I really want them to find out what happened. After three days on site, Ken and Ian head home to finish the investigation from their offices. In the case of the crashed helicopter, the detective work continues in the Commission's Christchurch office. Four weeks after Green's accident was found, John Goddard is closely examining evidence from the wreck. He kept warning lights from the helicopter's instrument panel. Using a special scope, John carefully checks each of the light bulbs on the panel to see if they were on when the helicopter crashed. If there had been a gearbox failure or an engine shutdown, the bulb intended to warn the pilot would have been lit when the squirrel hit the ground. With the filament in that bulb running white hot, the metal strands will be stretched by the force of the impact. And it will stay stretched and deformed in quite a characteristic way. And uh, <clears throat> we call this hot stretch which is quite different from a uh, filament just breaking. Mm. All the coils, with the little tiny coils of the filament become stretched out and the filament takes up extraordinary shapes. But John can't make a definite finding from the broken bulbs. For several seconds before hitting the ground, the helicopter bashed through tall trees. The warning lights could have flashed on as it broke apart. So John thinks the bulbs were lit because the helicopter was crashing. But the evidence held in Trevor Green's GPS is much more conclusive. From the memory, John has calculated the helicopter's speed and the exact time of the crash. But what really catches his eye is how the helicopter made a completely unexpected turn. The straight line shows Green's usual course, but the fatal flight shows a gradual right-hand turn. The pilot drifted off track for 24 seconds before the crash. And that we know was the uh, position of the accident. Accident investigations are like detective work. It's a case of eliminating possible causes to reach the probable one. Several weeks after the float plane accident, Ian has some wreckage of his own to examine for leads. The float plane engine was shipped to Christchurch so that he and John can rule out any obvious malfunction. They want to be sure damage caused during the crash isn't hiding bad maintenance or metal failure. This is the crankshaft, yes. It's the propeller, basically, is on the front of the engine here. A spiral crack running around the propeller shaft would mean a fault in the metal. But the brake is square, which shows the propeller was broken off by the crash, not before. It's not a fatigue crack, it's immediately obvious. In other words, the propeller uh, has Trans transmitted tremendous bending force. Examining so much bent metal reminds Ian of the crash site and how each accident takes its toll. I think when you go into a scene like that, and uh, the Tower one is an example, 
uh, John's one of the helicopters, another example, you're going to come across some pretty unpleasant sights. And I know that uh, I myself didn't sleep very well for that, that, that first night. I'll take some of the emotions home and uh, try and talk through those. Um, but I'm perhaps, uh, shall I say, known to be a little bit quieter in that area and, um, and you know, just accept it. Um, people don't need to hear my, uh, my worries, my burdens. Ian's family has grown up around Air Force bases. His boys follow his investigations in the news. That family support is crucial to him. Being called in the middle of the night and heading away early in the morning or uh, not being home for the weekends, um, they can see a reason for it. And so you don't have to worry about that aspect while you're away uh, trying to concentrate on the investigation. It's, it's a very important part of your life. And when Ken arrives home from days away on an investigation, he focuses on his wife and three kids to help him clear his head. I think it's wrong to come home and dwell on it and to be going through the, the what-ifs and the probable causes in your mind at home. And I think you need that ability to switch off from the job. So I think if you hold it in and you become very closely involved in it, um, I don't think you'd last in the job very long. His wife Jan acts as a sounding board and she reads all his reports so she knows what's on his mind. Ken's always been a person who likes mysteries and solving things, so I think that's um, part of the investigator's role. Um, and I think he likes to get to the bottom of things, and he likes the truth. I, th I think you need to be emotionally stable, you need to be honest, you need to be prepared to um, hang in there and dig into some issues, and you need to develop a little bit of a thick skin too in terms of um, as much as you try not to upset people, you do upset them, because sometimes you ask some pretty um, searching questions. As the float plane investigation continues, Ken collects evidence from several experts who have helped analyse the weather, the company structure, and especially the post-mortem evidence. The Commission's medical expert is Rob Griffiths. He's a pilot and a doctor who works with pathologists to find out what blood and tissue samples reveal about the pilot's health before an accident. We're looking at patterns of injury. Uh, we're looking for uh, either known or undisclosed um, medical problems to see whether they could have been impaired by alcohol, drugs, or other chemical contamination in the cockpit, for example. We picked up a serious case of carbon monoxide poisoning in a pilot in an accident a few years ago, a, a finding that we weren't expecting, and because the aircraft had flown into the ground at very high speed, there was very little evidence from the aircraft wreckage that we were going to have a problem with carbon monoxide. So these things are worth testing, and we test for them every time. Rob has several x-rays he uses to teach other doctors a recognised pattern of injury. They show whether a pilot was holding the controls at the point of impact. There are fractures here and here um, in the forearm which are caused by the pilot bracing just before the impact uh, takes place. The base of the thumb has been fractured and then dislocated outwards, ripping it basically out of its socket. As the hand gets thrown forward in the final impact, the knuckles here would get mashed up against the uh, instrument panel, causing these quite complex fractures on both sides. Those fractures didn't show up in Trevor Green's hands. But Green's regular medical tests show a very small flaw in the electrical system of his heart. The international standard is very strict, and the 47-year-old pilot was correctly cleared to fly. But combined... Rob believes the pilot probably had a weakened heartbeat when he crashed. The risk is infinitesimal. The decisions that go on about pilot fitness at the CAA involve a very complex weighing up of the benefits in terms of the experience of those pilots to the aviation community that will be lost if they, re they retire on medical grounds prematurely against the risks of what would happen if those people continue to fly. Eight months after the helicopter accident, the report is published. Following evidence from the GPS and post-mortem, it found the helicopter was probably functioning normally, but the pilot's heartbeat may have slowed or changed suddenly, causing him to lose control. In Tiana, the findings come as no surprise to company manager Ian Buick, but he reads the report with mixed emotion. There was no reason for him to suspect that this sort of thing would happen to him. Um, it's a problem with humans. You can build 20 helicopters identical, but there's no two people the same. Um, those 
left behind, it was important to, to have an answer. Um, and we were relieved that the company was cleared, but there's not a day that I wouldn't swap all that for having Trevor and his passengers back with us. It's um, one of those injustices of life, if you like, but uh, and life was never meant to be fair, was it? Meanwhile, in Wellington, the float plane investigation is taking a disturbing turn as Ken starts questioning the pilot's style of flying. Passengers are telling Ken that Marty Davis flew across mountain ridges very low to the ground. Um, which is a bit of a concern to us, really, um, particularly in scenic um, sort of operations. Um, and we have had some uh, passengers say, some previous passengers say that they were quite frightened um, on the flights. And this is not just from one person, this is from several people saying very, very similar things. Ken has a video from passengers to show the commission psychologist Keith McGregor, who has some disturbing news of his own to the float plane company about Davis flying too low five years before the footage was taken. Keith McGregor's been checking on the company's culture and attitude towards safety. He has just interviewed the airline manager. That's incredibly close. Yes, very close. That's, that's it. But Keith's not impressed with the owner's explanation. And I got straight on to Martin and he said we weren't too close. That would be five years ago. I then asked him, well, had there been any more formal follow-up? Basically, he said no, he hadn't. I asked him again about whether he ever followed up with passengers. And he said constantly. And when I said, well, what does that actually mean? And he said, well, I, I go down to the um, gate and open it, and when they come out, I say, how is that? But he seems to have a major problem with rules, regulations, and paperwork. A safety audit of Water Wings Airway had recently found six breaches of aviation regulations. The company owner asked Civil Aviation to withdraw three of their complaints, but he's worried they'll still count against him in the TAIC investigation. I don't believe I should be worried that I would wear the blame, but because of the environment, um, with this changing rules and the uncertainty that CAA have caused in aviation, um, I do you know, have a little worry there, but I shouldn't have it. We're a good operation. You know, we've been going for a long time and we've been approved. But Keith says but Water Wing's attitude towards safety is haphazard at best. Marty Davies' passengers could have been told the legal minimum height is 500 feet above the ground. Keith also says mystery passengers should have made random checks on pilots and the company shouldn't just wait for passengers to complain. Because that scene is not part of our culture that we go running and tell on somebody so that uh, if you're just relying on other people to keep you informed it's, you're, you're taking one hell of a risk. He says Water Wings didn't worry about the pilot because Davis hadn't done any damage to his plane. And he said if you get slack in a float plane you bend it. They have no brakes and they have a skin that's as thin as a paper you're writing on. Effectively his process for monitoring the performance of the pilot was whether the plane was bent or not. As with all reports, five months after the accident, Ken takes his findings to the three commission members. Although wind conditions or visual illusion might have played a part, his report says the greatest problem was Marty Davis taking unnecessary risks. Only one thing, and that's the pilot's unsafe act. What evidence do we have of that? As we went on the investigation, um, people came out of the woodwork, literally, and started to tell me things about the pilot, because I'd flown with him. Um, some of the comments in the letters were um, fearful, frightened, terrified, will never fly in a light aircraft again. The accident report does talk about severe turbulence close to the mountain range, but Ken believes Marty Davis would have outflown the bad weather if the company had made sure he was flying by the rules. That, that's relevant, isn't it? Because the meteorological evidence was updrafts and downdrafts on mm. that there was turbulence, setting up winds. If you fly in mountainous terrain, you will encounter downdrafts, and you just have to plan your flight accordingly. Um, and if you Which are, is simply you fly high. Ex well, that's one of the defences. If you fly high and you give yourself a, an altitude margin, then if you encounter a downdraft, you've got that altitude buffer, and it shouldn't necessarily push you into terrain. But if you're cutting your margins, um, and you encounter a downdraft, um, you could well end up on the side of a hill. 
my firm opinion is that had the organisation put in place even the most basic supervision practices, regular briefings on maintaining minima, um, mystery passengers, all this type of thing, that they would have got the message across to the pilot that we do not, you know, you are not to break those minima. Nine months after the float plane accident, Ken's report is published. The findings say the pilot probably tried to cross the ridge at low level, and despite turbulence or downdrafts, the accident could have been avoided. Also, the company had not checked their pilot was meeting the safety standards. Pilot's widow, Joanne Davis, was shocked by the report. Joanne and her lawyer supplied references from locals who said Davis was a very competent and reliable pilot. Um, I think the whole report is wrong. I don't believe that the um, air accident inspectors properly investigated the accident. I've viewed um, both videos and I also got two experienced field and pilots to look at the videos with me. Um, they both agreed that it couldn't be classed as low flying and one of them actually said that the videos wouldn't stand up in court. Um, when flying in the mountains, they can look close, it's an optical illusion, but you're not actually as close as you think you are. Um, and if people haven't been pl flying in those conditions before, of course they're going to think that the mountains are close, but in reality they aren't. And the coroner yeah, issued a different finding after his inquiry, after four Fiordland pilots said severe downdrafts or turbulence might be to blame. The coroner said their testimony helped balance the commission's findings about Davis. And he then came to the conclusion um, that the cause of the crash is unknown, and I agree with his findings. Like Joanne Davis, the victim's family think fault should be found with the weather, not the pilot. I was hoping to get it, uh, an answer to sort of help us with our grieving a bit more, but when it actually came out as pilot error, it really sort of got to us a wee bit over the Christmas period because most of us were saying, now, if it wasn't pilot error, our family would have been still here today. And that wasn't the answer that I wanted. Yeah. Well, it's been quite hard. We'd only been married for seven and a half months. I'd resigned from a good job um, because we're going to Alaska for the off-season. We were going to come back and probably build a house and start a family. Um, so I feel that my whole future's basically been wiped out. And, yeah, receiving the draft report, the way it was written, was a bit of a shock. Um, and having um, to fight to keep my husband's reputation intact, it's been quite hard as well. Although his findings have been criticised by people close to Davis, Ken's focus isn't on blaming him. His report includes seven safety recommendations aimed at the wider flying community. They are simply designed to stop this type of accident killing five more people. The public have a right to expect to arrive to buy a ticket on an aeroplane, to hop on board that aeroplane and to arrive safely at the other end. And they have a right to expect that. And, uh, you know, if they end up, if, if an aircraft ends up in a smoking hole in the ground somewhere between departure and the destination, then something's gone wrong with the system and we need to investigate the system. The owner of the float plane company, Chris Willett, declined a second interview once the report was published. Meanwhile, changes to aviation regulations mean that the company's safety systems now play a much bigger part in whether airline operators are given a new license or not.